the biggest crock that someone could sell you is a guarantee. My mother would always say that guarantee is, is, is a promise made to a fool. There's no mm. guarantees, right? So whatever you do, you have to do it because you want to do it. A lot of times we we make sure, we try to do something because of what it's going to get us. But in my case, and what I'm in, inviting you to do is to do it for the for the thing itself, right? The, the the means is the end. Do it because that's what you're meant to do. Like so, for example, when I was becoming a personal trainer, everybody was telling me, everybody was telling me. Elliot, you have to train women because women are the ones that are going to pay for personal training. Men don't want to pay for somebody to teach them how to work out. Um, on top of that, you know, I wanted to train young men. I want to train athletes because I was a football player. And people, everybody told me, it was like, Elliot, you're not going to make any money. No one, these young kids don't have any money. The parents are not going to pay for it. And it's not that I didn't believe them. I just didn't care. I was like, well, then I just won't have any money. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'll, whatever they can pay me, I'll do it. I'll just do it because I want to do that. That's what I want to do. And money, not that, not that money wasn't important to me, but it was an afterthought for me. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I'm super fired up today to be joined by the one and only Elliot Hulse. Elliot, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today. My pleasure. Yeah, man, uh, I'm super excited. I know, like you said, I know you're a little under the weather, but uh, so I appreciate you still uh, still joining me today. But Elliot, as a lot of you guys probably already know, is one of the original uh, fitness YouTubers, uh, one of the original influencers on YouTube and, and Coach Strongman. And you created Strength Camp from essentially equipment from a junkyard. And I'm just super honestly inspired by that story because it's just like anybody can make their dreams a reality Any, anybody can make their dreams come true if they if they're creative enough and and, and want a way want to find a way to make it happen and so I kind of want to start there and orient some of the listeners a little bit more on, on your story tell us kind of like how the idea came about that you wanted to create strength strength camp from just like junkyard uh, equipment well, it started way back in 1994 when my uncle, who was, at the time, he was an accountant and he decided that he wanted to quit that and become a personal trainer in a time when, you know, only Hollywood celebrities had personal trainers. And he was living in Jersey City and he decided, well, you know, what? I like to lift. I like to, he was a bodybuilder. He was a marathon runner. He was an athlete. And so he decided he was going to work for himself out of the back of his car uh, going around teaching people how to exercise. It was the weirdest thing. But anyway, he would come over to our house when I was a kid and he would teach me how to lift too. And so I saw two things at once that I knew I wanted. I wanted to teach people how to lift for a living, but also to work for myself. That was the two things that my uncle did that I never saw before in my life. You can make a living teaching people how to exercise. And then also, you know, it was a new thing, 1994, right? We take it for granted now. Yeah. Uh, but then also he worked for himself, essentially. And so that kind of like opened my mind up to the idea that this is a possibility. And I knew from that moment on that that was what I was going to do. When I was uh, 23, 24 years old, I got married and we had our first child and my wife and I moved down to Florida and I really didn't have any opportunities. Uh, I ended up working at a fitness gym and rose to the top of the ranks very quickly because I discovered that sales and marketing is key, no matter how good of a trainer you are. And so uh, at that point, I decided I was going to branch out on my own. And I didn't have any money. I didn't have any, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But I had a van that my dad gave me that was our kid, you know, kids grew up with this van. And so inspired by Zach Evanesh, who's a guy who started making YouTube videos back in like 2008. Um, he was training people in his garage with used equipment and trash, like tires and sandbags and uh, things you find in the junkyard, chains, ropes. And so because I had no money, but I wanted to, I wanted to work for myself, I decided to take my van around town and I went to junkyards and I went around, went around finding tires and sleds that I would use as sled sandbags. I remember spending one Saturday all day filling up sandbags. And then I started training people in the park with it before boot camps was even a thing. Like boot camps became very popular, I guess, maybe 10, 10, 15 years ago. 
I'm not so sure anymore. But before it was even a thing, and I called it strength camp because instead of just, you know, people doing calisthenics or running around and jumping and shit, I was, I had people lifting heavy sandbags and dragging tire sleds and pushing my van. And um, it kind of took off in terms of uh, locally, like people, I, I created a website, which of course, like that was when Google first came out, right? So the whole thing is like, I'm a pioneer, meaning that not by my own choice, but by the fact that I started coming of age when YouTube first came out, Google first came out. So it was like the first of basically all these things. And as a result, you know, I, I figured out how to get my website to rank very high. I had a lot of clients. Then I started making videos on YouTube to show people what I'm doing so that they maybe would come to my strength camp. And then that kind of turned into, wow, uh, there's like millions of people all over the world watching this YouTube thing. And then they started watching me. You know, I was just in a little podunk city in, in East, West Florida, St. Petersburg. It was like, it was a shithole town. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and I became like YouTube famous. And it was, it was kind of weird. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. I didn't, I, I love the story from your uncle because I think a lot of us need a, a, some we need to see what's poten- what has the potential to come true sometimes for us to be able to uh, kind of do it ourselves and, and make it happen ourselves. And kind of one of the big takeaways that I'm having from this is there's so many people who don't take action on something because they're not sure of the result or the benefit that they're going to get from it. But so much about being successful is having the faith to take action, not even knowing if there's gonna any gonna be anything that comes from it. So like, and that's kind of what, what you did, right? Like you went on your own at, at this 23, 24, and, and you started this thing not knowing what it was going to turn into, not knowing that you were gonna get this big, uh, but, you, but you did it anyway. So what's kind of the message to somebody on how they should, how they can take action even though they don't know what the end result's gonna, gonna give them? Well, that's really always the case. The biggest crock of shit someone could sell you is a guarantee. My mother would always say that guarantee is, is, is a promise made to a fool. There's no mm. guarantees, right? So whatever you do, you have to do it because you want to do it. A lot of times we, we, make sure, we try to do something because of what it's going to get us. But in my case, and what I'm in, inviting you to do is to do it for the, for the thing itself, right? Mm. The, the, the means is the end. Do it because that's what you're meant to do. Like, so for example, when I was becoming a personal trainer and, you know, the, the, by 2003, like when I started, I, I went into my career. My uncle started in back in 1994 by, you know, 10 years later, I was getting the ball rolling. So it was like a legit profession at that time, 10 years later, my uncle was a pioneer and he didn't know what was going to happen. But when I was becoming a personal trainer, everybody was telling me, everybody was telling me, Elliot, you have to train women because women are the ones that are going to pay for personal training. Men don't want to pay for somebody to teach them how to work out. Um, On top of that, you know, I wanted to train young men. I want to train athletes because I was a football player. And people, everybody told me, it was like, Elliot, you're not going to make any money. No one, these young kids don't have any money. The parents are not going to pay for it. And it's not that I didn't believe them. I just didn't care. I was like, well, then I just won't have any money. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'll, whatever they can pay me, I'll do it. I'll just do it because I want to do that. That's what I want to do. And money, not that, not that money wasn't important to me, but it was an afterthought for me. I needed money. I had a wife and child and I have four children now. So it's not that money didn't mean anything, but to me, it was, it was not the goal. It was what was a result of me being focused on what I want to do. Mm. you have to have a, a bigger reason for doing it in the first place rather than just the end result. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. I like that. Um, I think one of, you know, this is called the best you podcast. I think in order to get closer to the best version of yourself, one of the most important things that we can do is to try to constantly evolve and, and constantly transform. And I think one of, you know, your biggest things is you have tried so many different things. You've done so many different styles of training, you've did different spiritual practices and and all these different things. And so I think we all need to 
intentionally transform in certain ways in order to upgrade to the to greater versions of ourselves. So what has kind of initiated some of the transformations that you've gone through in regards to like, I'm going to start training differently because of this. I'm going to start studying this differently because of this. Like what's initiated some of the transformations that you've gone through? I have like a childlike mentality. I just got to be completely transparent. I get excited like a little kid. Maybe, you know, they told me I had attention deficit hyperactive disorder when I was a kid. And I'm still kind of the same way because I get excited about new stuff, new beginnings, mm. brand new stuff. So uh, I don't want to say that I get bored, but I tend to master things or I tend to like fulfill my, quench my thirst with things and then be ready for the next. And so, you know, a lot of people, they, they think that maybe that was a conscious strategy for me and that they should do it too. But I think it's just, it's just my nature. It's just my nature to, hey, this looks great. It looks like something worth exploring, going deep into it. And when I go deep, I go deep. I don't, I don't go halfway with anything. It's, I'm going to go mm -hmm. two feet in. And so with that, I can say, wow, I really quenched my thirst with that. I really got what I was looking for here. Hey, look, that looks pretty cool too. I'm done here. I'm done here. I don't understand people. And it's just, again, it's just my nature. I'm not denigrating anybody or telling anybody they should be like me because there's some bad parts to this too, right? Like my life is chaotic because I'm all over the place, but I just recognize and appreciate my nature in that once I fulfilled my place, I'm ready and willing and excited to move on to the next thing. I don't understand how people stay stuck with one thing. There's only mm -hmm. one, actually there's two things. There's only two things that have been consistent in my whole life. And that's my wife, because we started dating when we were 14 years old. And I was lifting and I started doing it when I was 14 years old. Both those things I discovered at age 14 have been my, rail, my, my two railroad tracks that have kept me somewhat grounded. But everything else in my life was, has been a matter of experiment. I like to experiment. I like to try. I like to, you know, people call it evolve. You use that term evolve. I'm not so sure if it's evolved because sometimes I feel like I'm running in circles, but I'm okay with that. Talk to me a little bit more about that when you when you say you're running in in circles rather than evolving. Tell me what, what do you mean by that? Evolve means that you're trying to get somewhere, mm. right? When you someone say evolve, they think that they think progress. They think that you're moving towards some destination. Mm. But for me, life is more cyclical. My life is, is, is less about getting somewhere. And again, once again, it's about the means. I'm not concerned about the end so much as I am the means. And so mm -hmm. I'm fully engaged, engrossed, and enrolled in the means at the moment. Right? So there's, there's no sense of needing to get somewhere. There's how can I fulfill this place right now where I'm at? Yeah, no, I, I like that. I kind of want to dive deeper into that thought because, you know, one of the sayings that you would always say as it was kind of your mission early on is get to the strongest version of yourself. And and I think, and, and my obviously thing is get closer to the best version of yourself, very uh, relatively similar. And I always almost kind of think of it linearly sometimes in regards to like, okay, if I'm here and the best version of myself is here, how, like, how can I evolve or how can I transform into that person? So, and I don't know if that's how you thought of as the, the strongest version of yourself. And so how do you, what do you kind of, how do you picture the getting to the strongest version of your, of yourself? If, and I'm not saying it has to be linear, but how do you picture getting to the strongest version of yourself if it's, if it's not linear? That's something that I used to say. I don't say that anymore, really. Okay. I don't really believe that. <laughs> I don't really believe that anymore. Uh, get, again, what, that, what ends up happening when we do that is we have a, uh, an ideal, which is usually a conception, which is often detached from reality for what I'm supposed to be. And usually mm -hmm. that comes from culture. It comes from movies, music, our friends, our parents, whatever's uh, currently popular in the culture. These are the things that we start to say, oh, I guess that's the strongest version of me or the best version of me because that looks nice what he has over there or how he's being over there. The way I think of it these days is a lot less about 
I want to get there to be that thing, right? Because it's all it's all mind fuck. It's all it's all your imagination. There's yeah. that that what you're thinking should be you is something that you just made up from what you heard before. That's not, that has nothing to do with the real you. To me, it's more these days. I think in terms of removing stuff, how can I get to the purest, most holy version of myself? Meaning how can I get to the pure essence of what's going on here? So for example, if I was trying to be the best version of myself, right? Strongest version of myself, I would stop, I would stop this tendency to be excited about different things because that's, that's not going to get me anywhere. Yeah. Right. That's not going to get me anywhere. If I, it's like, I said, like I said, it's like ADHD. But I would be being fake if I were to set aside my nature in order to pursue this imaginary path. Instead, what I do is I accept myself. I accept myself for who I am, where I am, and, 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 and what I am. And with that self-acceptance, what do I do? I remove judgment. I remove evaluation. I remove all kinds of heartache and pain associated with trying to fight against myself. I don't fight with myself anymore. I used to fight with myself. I used to fight with myself because I wanted to be something that I'm not. But these days I, I allow myself to be. Sometimes it works out great. Sometimes it don't work out so great. But all the time, I just appreciate it and say, that's what it is. That's who I am. I let yeah. the grace of God to carry me these days. I don't believe I do anything. So do you, you probably, would you use the term that I'm not necessarily trying to like improve then I'm trying to like uncover, like I'm trying to like be, like be more in touch with my true self and my true being. I'm not necessarily trying to improve who I am. Is that, am I understanding that correctly at all? Both of those are very active. Both of those are active trying to improve. Right. So it's a moving forward, but then you said uncover. Okay. I understand where you're going with that also, but what's really emerging is an allowance to be the essence of, 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 what makes us the strongest version of ourselves is when we allow ourselves to simply be. There's four modes of, of, of uh, behavior. There are four modes of being, in essence, uh, according to uh, Carl Jung, right? And if you ever do like these personality tests, right? He's got the four modes. You got thinkers, you got doers, you got feelers, right? So you're thinking, feeling, doing, but then there's being. Mm. The being aspect is the most confusing because everybody knows how to think because they taught us how to do that in school. And some of us become so trapped in the, in the, in the, uh, in the trap of thinking that we just think ourselves crazy. That's where most of us are. We're trapped in our imagination. In this day and age, we're trapped in our imagination. We're trapped in the clouds. Most of what we're thinking just comes from what the screen is showing us. And, and because the algorithms are so damn strong, all we're getting is a reflection of ourselves. And we know that the word narcissist narcissistic comes from narcissist because he got trapped in looking in the mirror of himself. That's what we're doing. Walking around thinking about ourselves and rethinking ourselves and get mirrors of ourselves all day long. You could do yourself to death. You could do, 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 but you've ever heard that you could climb the ladder to the top and find out that you're on the wrong wall. We do, do, do so much. And it ends up most of us live our lives like hamsters in a fucking wheel. So thinking doing is not going to get you there. Feeling we know has gotten our whole culture screwed up because everybody believes in this subjective truth. Because I feel like I'm a girl, I'm gonna go get, cut my dick off and become a transgender. This is how asinine we've become in terms of perverted thinking and trusting our feelings. Just because you feel something doesn't mean it's true. In fact, feelings have no meanings whatsoever. Feelings is a, is a feeling, right? If I slap you in your face, it doesn't mean anything. It means, wow, my face feels tingly. The meaning you put to it is based on the, and what kind of brain you have, what you decide to think, whatever association you give to it. So feeling doesn't afford you much of anything. And most of the time, for most of us, feeling just gets us trapped. This is why guys are addicted to porn. This is why guys are addicted to weed. These guys, guys are addicted to, to the, to the uh, computer. This is why video games. Guys are addicted to chasing poon. 
all this because I want a feeling. I want a feeling. Even spirituality has got wrapped up with feeling where people they go on all these, they go to the Amazon to drink these special drinks so they can feel spiritual, so they can feel God. We're in a feely, feely situation that has caused most men to be effeminate. Those three are subjugate to the fourth, which is to be. But to be sounds so strange. What do you do to allow yourself to be? Well, how do you think? To be, what does it feel like to be? Because we were so trapped in the Maya, in the matrix, in the material world of things that we don't allow. And being is a pure state of allowing. And so for me these days, it's less about any of those active things and it's more about allowing. And that requires faith. When you say that it requires faith, what do you mean by that? Why, why do we need faith to help allow us to be? You can act out of one of two places, love or fear. Most of the time our thinking is fear-based, right? And I'm not just talking, I'm talking for myself too. I recognize mm-hmm. these traps in myself. That's the only reason I can speak it. Most of our doing, our incessant doing, our active doing, our neurotic doing is what? Out of fear. Most of our feelings come from perverted experiences we've had when we were children or just unresourceful emotional content. Fear, fear, fear. Most of our actions are preceded by fear. And so with faith, right, there's trust that shit is not going to fall down around me if I don't overthink it. How about, how about this? Let me just give you an example. I have, a, I have two jobs. I was given two job interviews and I passed the two job interviews and I got two job opportunities or I got two women, right? These two girls like me. This is a common problem amongst young men. I got these two problems, right? I got these two. And so I can sit there and I can think, well, if I go this way, I'm going to go that way. If I think this way, I'm going to have it. And this could be good and this could be bad. This could be good. This could be bad, right? And you could be wrapped up in that. You could make yourself fucking sick just thinking about it. Or you could go based on your feelings. Wow, you know, I had this, I had this feeling when I went in there. Meanwhile, it was just because they had nice air fresheners. And I had this feeling when I was in there. Just, I felt peaceful when I was in there. I didn't feel so peaceful in there. Well, you know, that's kind of subjective and it really is not based on fact, Right. Or you can do, like I've told young men for ages, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You, you don't make the right decision, you make your decision right. So really in many cases, it's a matter of flipping a fucking coin and saying, boom, okay, I'm gonna go with this one. Because good or bad could make, be made of either one of them. Faith, and so I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say something that I, I, I might even take back later, but it's faith in yourself. Faith in the fact that whatever decision I make, I'm going to make it right. My dad is like this all the time. I'm I'm not nearly as faithful as my father is. And so I do a lot of prepping, right? I'm I'm a little bit of a paranoid guy about like economic collapse or like fucking zombie apocalypse. Like I get a little worried about that. So I like store food and stuff, you know, then like make sure I have water and stuff like that. You know, I'm a little bit of a nut. And my dad is like, you're so faithless. He's, He's like, I don't, my dad doesn't do any prepping. He makes fun of me. He laughs at me because I, because I'm kind of an amateur prepper. And he says to me, look, if shit hits the fan, I'll be able to handle it when it happens. I'll deal with that when the time comes. I'll cross that path when I get to it. I'll do it when I'm doing it. I'm not mm-hmm. going to try to do it before I'm doing it because what are you doing? Like I can make up, I can do, I have all the preps in the world an asteroid could just fucking fall on me. And it's like, well, what the hell was that for? What was the point there? Faith is a letting go. And that requires a childlike sense of being. You have to be a little naive. And that's why when you, you know, faith is kind of like, even Jesus says it, you have to have the faith of a child because it's childlike to have faith. And it's, a, and it's very difficult. But you know who allows themselves to be the true beers on our planet are children. Children are just being. They're not overthinking anything. They're not getting wrapped up in their feelings. And if their feelings rise, they immediately express it in order to relief themselves from whatever that burden is. 
And whatever they're doing, they're doing it out of their pure essence because it's fun. Watch a child play. He's not trying to get anywhere. Watch a kid play with some G.I. Joe figures. He's not trying to get anywhere. He's not trying to achieve anything. He's just being. Mm. So it takes a childlike mentality. So when are, when are you, I guess, personally right now able to just be the most? Like, what is it, what, what, what's the circumstance that allows you to just be the most and not think, do, feel? The best way is to look at the negative of it, what it's not, right? If I find that I'm overthinking, well, I know that I'm not allowing myself to be. Why? Because it's being is not overthinking. Being is not being wrapped up in thought and being, you know, like the whole be the strongest version of yourself. It's a conception. I'm visualized. I'm thinking about it. And that could be good. That could be bad. Because a lot of times we think about the ideal version of ourselves. And because there's a distance between where we are and where we want to be, there's anxiety. And most people, all that does is makes them more anxious. Right. So I know it's not thinking. If I'm too wrapped up in my imagination, I'm too wrapped up in judgment, I'm too wrapped up in evaluation, I know I need to back off a little bit. Okay, slow so, down, bring that, bring that what, in a little bit. What, what, is, what does backing off of that actually look like? Like how, how do you get out of your head? How do you not overthink? How do you not overfeel, if you will? You stop. You stop. Just stop it. You could, you could turn your brain off. Did you know that? I don't think I did. Yeah, you can stop thinking. You can, you know how you know that you can stop thinking? Because when you sleep and you're not thinking. Yeah. There's some conscious stuff going on. Maybe you're dreaming or maybe you're not. I heard that the purer you are of es- in essence, the less you dream. So there's, a, there's content in there, but you don't have to think. The brain is a tool. The thinking brain is a tool. The neocortex, let me put it that way, because I, I can't say the brain itself. Because we got the reptilian brain, right? You got your brainstem that does all the parasympathetic stuff in your body that you're not even thinking about, right? So, of course, the brain is still working. So, I'm not completely correct when I say the brain, right? And then you got the limbic system, which is the, the cortex, right? You could call it the middle brain, which is more associated with feeling than anything. But feeling doesn't need to be controlled. Feeling needs to be left alone. But I'll get back to that in a moment. The thinking brain, the neocortex brain, the brain that allows us to do mathematics, that allows us to see the past and and match it up with the future, it's a good brain to have if it's not running rampant. And the good thing about being a human being is we could decide when and when we want to use it and when we could turn it off. Most of the time, it's become our enemy because we're using it against ourselves only to make ourselves sick, thinking about shit that really don't matter or things that we have no control over. There are certain things that just you have, you have no control over that. Why are you thinking about it? What are you going to do? Is there anything you could do? There's another one from my father. He would say, if there's nothing I can do about it right now, why am I going to lose sleep over it? You can't, you, you can't think yourself out of this problem right now. You just have to wait for that to come. You just got to wait for that to come. And guess what? You do it. You'll know what to do when you're doing it. And I used to say that, I'll be like, what do you mean? Like, how am I going to know what to do if I don't think about what I'm going to do? And he said, you'll know because you'll be doing it. <laughs> and it's kind of a mind fuck for a guy like me who likes to think, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting it now in my older age. I don't have to be a slave to my thoughts. I don't have to be a slave to my thinking, especially if it's not going to yield anything of any value. And most of the time, it don't yield anything of any value. Yeah. I kind of want to go back a little bit to, you know, how we talked about how you you look at it more as going in, in a circle and, and I use the word evolve and I use the word transform and I'm going to use the word transform again, but I know it's not necessarily that that might not be the, the right word, but of the different things that you have experimented with you have that childlike mentality you you want to you want to do something new you're bored with one thing you want to you want to go into another thing of the things that you have jumped into or of the again transformations quote that you've made has there been any one that you feel like was most important or that you got the most out of no no because i'm a fool if i could look back and think that i know what 
I was doing because I never knew what I was doing when I was doing it. I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. I'm just doing what's in front of me nine times out of 10. I didn't know I was going to become YouTube famous. I was making videos with a flip cam because I wanted people to come into my gym. I didn't make myself YouTube famous. When I saw people were paying attention, then I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, it, that's a sign, right? A lot, of, a lot of times we're trying to plan this. So like guys your age or guys that are coming up now, they want to plan to become YouTube famous. But a lot of times you lose, because you're so focused on what you're trying to do, you miss the revelation. You miss the signs. You miss the mm -hmm. omens. You know, some people will say God was talking to me, but a lot of times, but really it's, oh, I'm paying attention to what's happening right now. I don't know shit about YouTube. I don't know anything about it. I knew nothing about it, except hey, I made these videos because I wanted my clients to share it with their friends so that they could bring some more people in. And then I'm looking, I'm saying, oh, there's a lot of people paying attention. Let me make more. And then I make some more. Okay, and then I see some momentum. You see what I'm saying? But I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't plan what I was doing. Yeah. I was kind of going with the flow. I was just, and so when we let go of our plans and we just pay attention to what's happening in front of us, it's revealed. The path is revealed. So anything that I say today is foolish because Hindsight is 2020. I could be so smart, and this is why I don't like giving this kind of advice sometimes. I could be so smart now because I could look back on my life and act like I did that, but I didn't know what I was doing when I did that. I was just being present in the moment. I was doing it because that's what I was doing. Why did you do that? Because that's what I was doing. That's what happened. I didn't plan that. You see what I'm saying? But yeah. what happens is, and you know, what happens is we end up looking at people as examples and then think that I'm going to go and do what he did so that I can get what he has. Right. But that throws you off your path because if you go and do what somebody else does, hoping to get what they have, then nine times out of 10, you're going to miss the opportunity that's in front of you. That's uniquely yours. Mm -hmm. So let me put it this way. When I was younger, right. I wanted to be like Tony Robbins, right. I saw Tony Robbins. And I saw how he was on stage and he would be surrounded by thousands of people. I used to watch him and I would watch Joel Osteen. I was like, wow, these guys are on stage and they're surrounded by thousands of people and they're on broadcast television. That's what I want to do. I had this sense in me. I watched them and I saw that I want to do that. With that sentiment in sight, right? With that feeling, because it, it's normal and natural to sort of move that way. Had I been attached to being like Tony Robbins, I would have been on speaking tours, traveling the country in order to sell tickets to get thousands of people to come to me because that's the way he did it. Little did I know that the internet was going to make a YouTube that I could literally stand in my fucking garage and put up on the camera and a thousand people are going to come to me. Had I been wrapped up in doing it the way Tony Robbins did it, I would have freaking made myself crazy trying to, and I would have lost my family. I would have, I would have, I would have nuts flying all over the freaking country, flying all over the world, trying to get something that I want, but being so focused on how somebody else got it, then watching what's in front of you, watch what's in front of you. What's the opportunity right in front of you? When that's we're good. present or we're allowing ourselves to be, that's when those things are revealed. But when we're thinking and we're imitating and we're judging and we're trying, that's when we lose it. We miss it. You miss it because you're looking over there. You're not looking right here. What's in front of you. So do you feel like, is there a balance in between? We should try to plan to get somewhere or is it just like, like, do you just wake up and it's, it's day by day, I'm going to attack today. Do you know what's going on next week? Do you know what you're trying to do next week, next month, next year? Or is it just kind of like, I am going to just be today and I'm going to do what happens today? I think in a way we're more psychic than we believe. The problem is that most of our psychic premonitions don't come true because we get in our own way. So when you have a vision the first thing to do is to appreciate that vision. Wow, that's a nice vision. 
That's a nice idea. I like the way that feels. I'm going to hold on to that vision, but I'm not going to pursue it. I'm not going to try to make that happen. I'm going to watch how it unfolds. This is, it's taken me time to figure this out, right? Because I'm telling you how I was before and where I am now, just the insight, wisdom, age. I figure some th things out. It's better to have, let me, let me give you another example. I'm living on a 42 acre ranch right now. I just moved out to Central Florida. I was living on the coast. I moved to Central Florida and I'm living on 42 acres and I don't know how the fuck I got here. I don't know how I got here, but I do know I saw it in my mind's eye. I do know. I remember being 24 and thinking I want a homestead because I met the, I met, uh, I used to buy groceries. I used to buy food from the Amish because I lived in New York. And I remember going to visit the Amish and I was like, this is the way to live. I like the way these people live. And I held that seed in my heart. But then you know what happened? Life went on. And I lived in New York City. I lived in Tampa Bay. I moved, you know, various different places. And so even though that seed was in my heart, and even though I remember as a kid, I remember as a youth, wow, having that sense that, yeah, this is pretty cool. I had to get on with my life and I had to do what was in front of me. I was having children. I was building businesses. I was doing strawman. I did all the things. And then all of a sudden, 2020 shows up. Nobody knew what the fuck was going to happen in 2020. 2020 shows up. All my kids are kicked out of school. My wife and, you know, the people in our community, we started to distance ourselves. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, even though we weren't looking, my wife gets an email that says, hey, there's 42 acres in Eustis, Florida. That's up for sale. And it's like right within my budget, right? It's like perfect. I, and we, neither of us looking. And we go, and you know what I said too? Because in my, in my older age wisdom, I saw it and immediately I was like, I gotta have it. But then I said, let's just see. Let's go look at it. No big deal. If it's available, if we can afford it, if not one part of me was like, I'm going to make this happen. An old me, a younger version of me would have been like, if there was a roadblock or we bumped up against something, I would have been like, okay, what do I got to do to fix that? How can I get around this? But if I would have hit a roadblock, you know what I would have done? That's okay. That's okay. It wasn't for me. So my point is that if you have a vision for something in your life, the old way, the unevolved, dare I say, the unevolved way, it's a stress, scratch and claw and need and fight and go and grind and try to get it. We're nine times out of 10. You're just going to get in your own way. You're going to make yourself sick. You're going to have coronary heart disease and your, and your family's going to fall apart. This is what happens for guys. They chase success, but everything else falls apart. Rather than that, rather than that, see it, appreciate it, and then go about your life with a question. You know what the question you ask yourself? Hmm, I wonder how that's going to unfold. That's what I ask myself nowadays. When something is on its way or something I want, I, I don't say how am I going to go get it. I say to myself, I wonder how that's going to unfold. I wonder how that's going to happen. I wonder now. I don't force. I just keep an open question. How's that going to happen? Like right now, we are under pressure because I have 42 acres and I, and I got to pay taxes on the 42 acres. And in order to not pay taxes on the 42 acres, I need to get an agricultural exemption. And in order to do that, I have to have agriculture on here. I have to have cows or I have to have chickens or I have to, I got to do something. And then it also, I have this vision that I want to turn this into a retreat center, right? So I'm trying to blend in my mind, just having fun. You know, I'm not trying to force anything. How am I going to get this tax exemption? And how am I going to turn this? How is this going to turn into my vision, my dream? I would like for my parents to come live here. But you know what? I'm not doing anything about it. I see it. It shows up in my mind every once in a while. It comes up as a question. Sometimes my wife and I will talk about it, but she understands as I do because we've lived long enough together and to understand that it's going to unfold perfectly. It's, it's going to work itself out in the most miraculous way, better usually than the way I thought it would. So I just leave it alone. I like it. I like it. That's a, that's a very stress-free or uh, that definitely leads to less fear and, and, and less, uh, less of all that, all the negative emotions and feelings and stuff.
Faith. Boom. Faith. That's what it is. Because if I was operating out of fear, I'd be trying to put the wheels in motion. I'd be trying to force it and making it happen. And just from my experience, that doesn't lead to where I want it to go. If I and let go, it goes where it's supposed to go. So, so j- before I ask the last question, I kind of want to get just one more um, insight onto the faith thing because, you know, but you talked about earlier, you, you mentioned I might even take this back because you you, you said it, it's kind of faith in in yourself. Is it is it faith in yourself or is it faith in that things will turn out how they should be? Is it faith in, is it faith in God? Is it, or what, what do you think it's faith in? Because I feel like the word faith means it has to be faith in something. I don't, I don't maybe not, but. Yeah, you're right. And the reason why I kind of hesitate when I say that is because who the fuck am I? Faith in me? I'm half retarded. <laughs> I tear my biceps. I make all kinds of mistakes. I, have, I don't have a track record to have faith in this guy. But it's who lives in me. Faith in God. That's really what it is. It's faith in God because it's the grace. It's only by the grace of God that the things have unfolded the way they had in my life. Because like I said, and I only notice because hindsight is twenty twenty, And I look back and I think, wow, I was a retarded kid. How did that all work out? I didn't really do it. I mean, I was the instrument for it to unfold. It happened through me, but I didn't make those things happen. Is faith in God, that God is active in my life and that these things, that's why I said before, we're almost, I think we're almost kind of psychic. The problem is that when God drops that seed, right? I don't think, I don't think that any of us have a, if, especially if it's a pure intention. A lot of our intentions aren't pure. They're perverted because they come from, they come from elsewhere and we're so focused on elsewhere that we don't really receive our own pure intentions. We're not honest with ourselves. If it's a pure intention, that essentially means that in a way God is saying to you, hey, look, this is, this is what's coming up. This is what's coming in your life. But what will happen a lot of times is we then, I'm going to do it. And then we try to grab that vision and we start trying to wrestle it into fruition. Sometimes it'll work, but you'll also die of a heart attack. You'll, all, you'll also ruin your family. You'll also have all kinds of fucking problems. Rather than that, see that vision, be appreciative. Thank you, God, for that vision. Thank you, God, for showing that. I wonder how you're going to bring that into my life. I wonder how that's going to unfold in my life. And do I need it? That's another thing. No. All I need is clothes on my back, food in my belly. Do I need that? No. But there's a sense that this is what's coming, and I'll be open to it. That's powerful. That's powerful. Well, before I ask the last question, Elliot, I just want to acknowledge you for your ability and your childlike mentality to just continue to seek wisdom and continue to be open to new experiences and new thoughts and new actions. And I think that the the way that you've continued to go in circles, if you will, um, <laughs> has has led you to a place where you seem very very strong in, in in your belief or your faith in the importance of just being and not thinking, doing, and feeling. And, and I think that's it's super powerful because I'm you know I haven't heard heard about a lot of these things before, and it's it's definitely making me definitely making me think. I don't believe I have. Robert Moore, PhD. He was a Neil Jungian psychoanalyst who uh, he did a lot of men's work. Carl Jung believed that the mind, that the, the psyche was quadrated. And that's why I brought up the thinking, feeling, doing, and being. But what he, what Robert Moore did was that he superimposed that upon mythological language. And he called it King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. Have you ever heard this? Mm-hmm. Within no. a man, there's a king, there's a warrior, there's a magician, and a lover. And each one of those are associated with those four modes of being. Thinking, magician. Doing warrior, feeling lover, being king. 
it's the crown jewel of being a fully integrated man is to access the inner king. And these are ways of being associated with the king. Mm. I like it. I like it. Well, yeah, dude, that's, that's powerful. That's powerful. Well, if you guys don't already, then you make sure you got to make sure you go um, follow uh, Elliot on Instagram at Elliot Holst with two T's. And uh, you can follow uh, him and, and Strength Camp on YouTube as well. Um, but yeah, last question. And so you might even want to <laughs> rephrase or, or come up with your own kind of different answer to the question, if you will, because the last question I always ask everybody is, I think getting closer to the best version of yourself is, is a constant journey. I don't think we're ever at that person. Um, and I also think it's a unique journey. I think the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So the way I always ask it is for you personally, if there are three things that you can currently do or currently work on to get closer to that best version of Elliot Hulse that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you could do or work on? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think I'll be fighting with myself until I die. I, 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 don't, I don't think until I become pure essence, until I become spirit, that I'll be free. So any working is just a struggle against flesh, flesh against flesh. And that's always, a, 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 it's always a losing battle, right? It's like fight, trying to fight, it's trying to uh, solve the problem at which it was created. More doing, is more doing going to solve anything? Is more working going to solve anything? Is more fighting going to solve anything? More resisting? going to solve anything? <laughs> I don't think until I can finally let my last breath out and drop this meat suit will I truly be free. <laughs> That's when the strongest version emerges, when it can leave this prison. I don't know. If, if, if you have a quick second, I might, I might ask just one follow-up on that. If, 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 you know, if not, you gotta, if you got to go, you got to go. You, go. you good with one more? Okay. I, I appreciate it. Um, so then, you know, you like in the gym, you work your ass off. You, you've, you know, you have all these books back there. You've read, you've, you have, you've done a lot of work on yourself. What for, if, why continue to do that stuff? If you feel like there's nothing to do or work on to get closer to the best version of yourself. I don't, I don't know if I asked that the right way, but why continue to do if there is, you know, we're not supposed to be doers, we're just supposed to be beers. Why continue to read? Why continue to seek wisdom? Why continue to train? All that stuff. Because it's there and I'm here. And so it shows itself to me and I'm still living in this flesh. I, this, like I said before, there's no freedom from it. You, I will be, even in the Bible, it says after Adam in the fall, he says, you will live by the sweat of your brow. For the days of your life, you will toil. There's no getting away from it. That's a part of the prison in the, in the fallen world, is that to the day of your death, you will work the soil. You will toil, you will toil and live off the sweat of your brow. It's our fate. Right. Um, there are cultures I and, and I used to think it was cool, but I don't I don't vibe with it anymore that believe that you should just let all responsibility go, let everything go and just sit cross legged and. And then you'll reach your you'll reach your uh, spiritual self, you reach your evolved self in this life. But in me, that in a way, that's problematic also. In a way, that's problematic also because it's, uh, it's, how could I say, it's an escape from the responsibility of mortifying the flesh. It's an escape of the responsibility to suffer. The opportunity, let me even put it that way, the opportunity to suffer. 
We have an opportunity here to struggle and to suffer and to fight in a way uh, with our surroundings. This is a good question. I'm struggling with this one right now. Yeah, well, and so if there is, I, w- I was going to say, you said you said it, the opportunity to suffer. Then what? what's the opportunity for? So like, I, I, you know, and, and my- Very good question. Okay. Mm-hmm. Very good question. That's a perfect question. Thank you. The opportunity is to build virtue. So maybe, maybe I'm wrong in that there's nothing, but the virtue of detachment, the virtue of humility. Because when we do escape this flesh suit, that's what we take with us. We take our virtue. We take what we've earned in the soul, right? Which are intangible things. And so to work in the same way I've been talking about working, regardless, it it teaches you the virtue of mortification and detachment. Meaning I am am mind over matter. I am more than this flesh. You could beat this flesh. You could beat me down. I'll, I'll work my fingers to the bone, but I will not be moved on the inside. I will not be knocked. I will not be uh, disturbed on the inside. And there's that kind of peace. So I mentioned before the, 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 the Buddhist or whoever that sits there hmm, that does this. Yeah. I've in my life been a fan of Osho. I, I've liked Osho. Osho's a crazy motherfucker, but he, made, he said a lot of things that made a lot of sense. And so he was a blend of the two. He would say that, I don't want you to become a Buddha because then you are not engaged in life. He says, I want you to become Zorba the Buddha. And Zorba, Zorba is from a movie called Zorba, Zorba the Great, Zorba the Greek. Zorba the Greek was a guy who was very sensual. He loved hard. He loved food. He loved women. He loved life. And he got engaged with everything. He was a yes man and he would do everything. So he says that to truly live is to be a balance of these two, is to be fully engaged, fully engaged, but totally detached. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that. I like it. I like it. I think that's a, I think that's a solid, I think that's a solid answer. Uh, for what the uh, the opportunity to suffer is. Um, well, again, man, appreciate you spending the time with me today. I appreciate you staying a few extra a few extra minutes longer. I know a lot of people got a lot of value from it, so I appreciate it, man.